exactly how the shepherds looked after the sheep is how, mm. that's the role of a pastor today that we're doing it for people we're making sure that they're, they're fed we're making sure that they're being taught well we're making sure that we're equipping them so it's preparing you know it's preparing our churches preparing our people to, to thrive in a hostile world I know pastors have to do a whole lot of other things but primarily this is our core business and I think it's confusing for people when we, we kind of hand out titles here, pastors everywhere, and then those people aren't pastoring. We've got a fantastic guest in the studio here today. We've got Pastor Glenn Cochran, sometimes referred to as the Bishop of West End Brisbane. Glenn, <laughs> we've known each other for about 10 years now. And I love our rich relationship and preach in your church and you've lectured in our Bible college. We do the annual cricket thing t- together. Mm. Uh, you're a great thinker, a funny guy and a pastor's pastor. Thank you so much for being on the Flourishing Life for this episode. Well, thanks for the invitation, Andrew. It's always great to hang out with you, whether it's on a podcast or the cricket or at Bible College. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, West End's your kind of your jam. But before we get into that, mm. for those of you who don't know you, like, like you, are you grooming the beard? Because Christmas is coming up, you're the token Santa in, in some sphere of influence you're involved in? Christmas is coming. So I always grow the beard when it gets a bit close to Christmas because it looks the real deal. And, uh, yeah, it's always good for conversation. Have you got your naughty and your nice list? Which, which one am I on? <laughs> 50 bucks? I was actually walking past, uh, we got some uh, Indigenous brothers and sisters down in Boundary Street a couple of weeks ago, and this guy yells out, Hey, Santa! <laughs> what am I getting for Christmas? And I just said, mate, it depends on what list you're on. And this lady sitting next to me, he's on the naughty list because he swears all the <laughs> time. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't who don't know you, can you give us a quick summary of your your life, the roles that you, you've had, the, the sort of the ministries that you've been part of, and, and kind of like the headline of what you're doing now. Sure. Well, grew up in Toowoomba, a really strong Catholic family. Uh, I walked away from all that about age 16 when my parents died. I uh, ended up uh, working for RACQ, which was a great job, and uh, eventually ended up working for RACQ up in North Queensland as a uh, uh, far North Queensland manager. And uh, that's where I uh, found the Lord. I hired a, a, an assistant manager in the office who at the time I thought was very, very straight, uh, but he, he loved the Lord and was a committed Christian and eventually uh, took me out to Calvary Temple in Townsville to a church was there under a guy called David Cartledge and I gave my life to the Lord on the 1st of April 1984 and not long after that was transferred back down to Brisbane to start their state training department here and where I met uh, my current wife and I left then to go to Bible college. Wow. So... Uh, uh, after only a, a couple of months, really, of, of being down here in Brisbane. And uh, that was really the start, I guess, uh, of everything for me. Um, I was never very good at school. I dropped out a few weeks into year 12. And it wasn't until after becoming a Christian that uh, I realised that I love to study and I love to learn. And so uh, that was the kind of beginning of the journey. Uh, and when we came to Brisbane, we went to what is now Nexus Church, Northside uh, uh, Christian family at the time. Who was the pastor there? Pastor then? John Lewis. Pastor was John pastor Lewis. There. Yeah. So I worked with Pastor John, and then later uh, with Pastor Murray Averill, who took over yeah. from John. Worked with uh, Murray there as well, and then ended up in uh, West End uh, just over ten years ago. So you planted a church there. Planted a church in West End. You yeah. also did some stint in because we've both got a passion for faith-based education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You did some time leading um, Christian Schools Christian Australia. Yeah, I was state executive officer between between gigs uh, working for John Lewis and then uh, Murray Averill. So uh, at one point I resigned from uh, Northside and took the job working with Christian Schools Australia. Yeah. And uh, then a couple of years later I went back and worked for uh, yeah, Murray, uh, Pastor Murray at, yeah. at uh, Nexus. There's a whole thing around yeah. that faith-based education. I might try and mm, twist mm, you and Craig mm, Muir, Dr. Mm. Craig Murison's arm to come on and, and talk about the phenomena of that around mm. Christ, Christian schooling, because you've seen that in that. Yeah. It's been quite a phenomena over at Northside, hasn't it? Well, it's South East ne- Queensland. Nexus, yeah. I think what's happened in South East Queensland 
in terms of faith-based education, Christian schools, yeah. uh, is not replicated anywhere else in the world. Yeah, okay. And that was pointed out by many, many years ago, one of the, uh, our Korean brothers who, who came out and was looking at what we were doing in terms of Christian schools in Australia. And he couldn't believe the size uh, of the schools, the yeah. quality of the schools. And just uh, and then, uh, of course, to, to know that they were um, you know, funded by the government as well, partially funded by the government, was he, he couldn't get his head around that. So yeah. I think what's happened in South East Queensland with City Point, you know... See, in 1978, COC at West End started mm. a version of that. It did, was, yeah. Was, yeah. Mm. We, I tell you what, mm. I'm going to sign you up for a podcast with Dr Craig Murison. We need to unpack that phenomena. It'd be great if we get the King's guys. Anyway, that's mm. a chat for mm. another time. Tell, tell me about... Today, how, today is today a representative day of, of what your of what your world is like s- serving Jesus. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a pretty good <laughs> representation today. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, early start this morning. I'm part of a business network uh, in West End, uh, which is a group probably yeah about uh, yeah, 28 people representing all different occupations, all different professions. We meet every Thursday morning. And uh, for a couple of hours uh, after that, I headed off to the gym uh, because I'm getting old and I've got to keep the, the body fit and healthy so I can go for another... Today's 10, leg 15, day, wasn't it? Leg day today, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I'm sitting down. Uh, of course, a podcast then yeah. with you. Then uh, I go straight from here. There's another ministry in West End, uh, like a collective or community of young creatives called Beth Barai. So they're around the corner from us in West End and I do a little bit of mentoring there with the, the guys who run that, a great couple who run that and some of the leaders there as well. And then tonight, uh, yeah, going to s- someone in the church, going out to their place for dinner. So that's pretty, yeah, that's quite a pretty so representative this is of what we almost do. almost like mm. a representative day in life of mm. Glenn Cochran, mm. pastor of an ACC church, N Church mm. at mm. West End, looking them up on Instagram. Mm. So how did you... How did you come about launching of, of planning a church in West End? Well, what a story, Andrew. And it really did start with a joke in, in, in one sense. You know, we had been um, uh, several, well, quite a few years ago when I was with at Nexus. Um, I love, you know, I love churches. I love working in church yeah. as a pastor. Uh, but when you're in a big church, you know, one of the things is that you're only surrounded by Christians all the time. And I love them, but I'm going to be in eternity with them forever. And I, I think I got a bit frustrated because I do love evangelism. I love, you know, being in places and reaching out to people and, you know, speaking about the Lord. And uh, I met Phil Mason, Phil and uh, Marie Mason from uh, Byron Bay in US yeah. Tribe. And uh, we kind of joined them. They were going into a New Age Festival. Uh, in, uh, then it was at the showgrounds here and then moved to the convention centre. And so we, for a couple of years, uh, I took a team from Nexus in the, and like that, that was just life-changing, um, you know, to, to see so many people who didn't know the Lord but were hungry for spiritual reality. After a little while, we, we did our own thing and uh, uh, opened up, a, uh, I guess, a shop in there called the Jesus Shop. We did it in the undercover markets in West End. Uh, where this old uh, Peter's ice cream factory is now, West beautiful West Village. Is that where you didn't do palm readings, but you did psalm, psalm, readings. psalm readings? Yes, didn't yes you? that's yeah. right. <laughs> well, I, I remember where our where our store w- was set up at the Mind Body Spirit was across from all the tarot card readers and palm readers, and yeah. I remember thinking, how am I going to engage people as they walk past the Jesus Shop, which yeah. is what we called it? And uh, I I just sat up one night and it was like free psalm readings. And so we would uh, select different verses, not all psalms, but mainly psalms, put them on nice little coloured bits of paper, tie a bow around them, and then people would come past and we'd say, would you like a free psalm reading? So people, yeah, take it. So they'd stop and they'd read it. And and that was really, that's how we engage with people. Some, you know, it didn't mean anything, but some, some would have tears in their eyes. And so we led some people to the Lord there through that. We got to pray for people. And that really... Uh, being in there in that Mind Body Spirit Festival, uh, one of the things I noticed, because we've always loved West End and we're in West End a little bit, but some of the businesses from West End were, you know, used to have uh, um, uh, representations in the Mind Body Spirit as well. Mm. I think at that time when we started, there, are, there was an occult shop and new age shops and, you know, right throughout West End. 
there's really only one there now, but, you know, when we first went in, there was probably about four. And so we were drawn to West End through that, and one day I remember driving down Boundary Street with my wife, Maureen, and, uh, uh, you know, the Lord just put me with the perfect partner, of course, because she follows yeah. all my harebrained ideas and, and is supportive <laughs> of them. But I was driving down Boundary Street, and as a joke, I said to her, hey, you know what, if I ever planned a church in West End, you know what I'd call it? And she said, what? And I said, I'd call it N Church. And she said, that quizzical look on her face, like, what are you saying? Why would you call it that? And I said, because I can legitimately put a sign up the road that says the end is near. Yeah. And it's true. You know. <laughs> like, yeah, like one so, of those crazy people exactly. on the side of the road <laughs> with a white beard but, looking like Santa Claus. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But like it was a joke. But do you know that wow. it, it seemed like the Holy Spirit took that joke and I thought, end church, West End. And like, it'd be too hard to plan a church in West End. And it's, it's really difficult. So that's where it started. And then over a period of time, it's like the, yeah the Lord just would not let me uh, let, let that go. And I came to a point where I thought, I've got to plant a church in West End. And so that was the beginning of the journey. And how many, what year was that? That was 10 years ago, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we just in September this year, we celebrated our 10 years uh, as a church in West End. Yeah. Mm. Like I've walked, like every year mm. we bring mm. students down mm. in Ministry Development Week mm. and you sit them, it's, it's a real favourite, um, one of our tracks, because <laughs> you good. sit down... You always buy coffee and cake for everyone. <laughs> You're trying to get a new pastor to come that's to help true. you, is that right? I am. I'm trying to get all your students But, but to you come. cast a vision because that's of oh, the roots of the COC movement. It's sort of in that yeah. West yeah. End area and that, mm. that's an inspiring story. And then the students go out and do prayer walks. One, one year we had this prophetic idea of getting an old shopping trolley <laughs> and um, buying some big four or five litre <laughs> containers of oil yes, and we yeah. just drizzled it yeah, all, all around yeah. the whole neighbour like anointing oil, <laughs> fresh <laughs> oil in West End. But, and we put letterbox, um, yes, letterbox yeah. things in mm. and weeks after you'd have people come yes, we visit, did. Yeah, your, yeah, visit your yeah, church. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, actually, and one of those couples who have just like, you know, one of the, just the solid couples in the church. That's his place I'm going to for dinner ah. tonight. They came uh, just after that, after we yeah. did that. So, yeah. But I was wondering, see, one time the teams were sent out, mm. so you and I went for a mm. bit of a prayer walk, walking mm. through, mm. and mm. I just mm. marveled, because mm. I don't want to embarrass you, but I was just, I, um, I marveled as we, we barely went 10, 15 metres without you having an interaction with someone mm. that you knew, and there was like beggar there, street people, indigenous people, business mm. owners, and you stick mm. your head in. Mm. I mean, you even had money in your pocket that you would give people, like, oh, you're going to need this for a meal tonight. And, and I think we walked and we walked down to the village mm. where, where the new work was, and mm. I was just overwhelmed by your love for West mm. End, literally mm. like you're the, like the bishop of West End. <laughs> you want to talk us through what, you, you, like what it's like? You've got a, like a parish mentality about it. You want to talk do, us through yeah, a bit of that? Yeah. yeah. I love that parish mentality. And West End really lends itself to that because of the river. It's a community. And if you're living in West End or you've lived in West End, it's a distinctly different community to yeah. anywhere else. Uh, it's rapidly changing, but it's still got this real sense of community. And I think that's because of the river. Um, it's a challenging area. You know, it's, when we went in 10 years ago, is the least church suburb in Brisbane. Mm. Um, and since then, two churches have, have kind of moved out. Uh, over that time, I think I've had, we've s spoken to three different people who were coming in to plant churches yeah. and, and eventually didn't, because there are a lot of challenges. But there is something about the community of, of West End that if you're, I, if you live in West End, you're a West End. If, if you don't, you're not. And that's why it was great for us, you know, a few years ago to get a location in West End where we, we, we've got like a residential office. So we live in there. We're in there five, six days a week. Uh, and, you know, we have our prayer meetings there in the office and uh, other things as well. But that really changed things for us as well. Um, mm. Just walking down the stairs, you know, walking into Vulture Street, round into the main drag of Boundary Street, and we're there. And so because you're there, you, you're talking to people, you're meeting people, you're in the shops. And, um, you know, they, uh, I, I think they appreciate the support. They appreciate, you know, mm. our, our prayers for them. Uh, we get a whole lot of conversations, you know, from different people. And 
it's just a, it's just a, a wonderful environment. I think it's the, the best place in the world to plant yeah. a church. I love and respect you. Like even you invited me to that business meeting, uh, and yes, you're giving a yeah. presentation, mm. and I watched live. I, I was mm. moved to tears mm. about their love and affirmation that they're going to sponsor you for another year, and just watch and say, "Oh no, we've already got that sorted. We'd already there have been machinations behind the scene because they loved you so much. You're like the god." The Godfather, I think. <laughs> God. Look, there are, there are a lot of names. Some of them I can't repeat on the Christian podcast. But uh, it, it, again, it's just a wonderful community yeah. of people. And, uh, you know, we're, I, I was actually talking about it this morning. I had to do a brief education piece yeah. because, you know, it's, it's all about referrals. It's about referring business to one another. And, yeah. you know, there's electricians and plumbers and physios and lawyers and, you know, the, uh, a whole gamut of you know, different occupations and professions. And there is a fair bit of referring of business, I think, you know, in the last 12 months within that small chapter, you know, 26, 28 people, you know, that have referred over $1.2 million worth of business. So, you know, if you're a small business, yeah. uh, it, it's a great place to be. And for me, I didn't join it for the referrals. I joined it for the networking uh, because a lot of those guys are in West End, some of them aren't, but a lot of them are. Mm. And if I can be in something that's involved in West End, it just gives me another layer, another level. Yeah. And I think of effective ministry too. And so they are incredibly generous. Any time I come to them with the project, when the war on the Ukraine broke out, yeah. we had some contacts. We'd, we'd contacts over there. We'd planted uh, a number of churches over there quite a few years ago. And uh, one of those contacts was, uh, at that time, was they were uh, acquiring medical uh, supplies in Poland and then taking them into the mm. Ukraine. And I mentioned that we were doing that project. And so suddenly all this money is coming into my bank account from this business network because they want to get behind it. And uh, any, any project that I have, whether we're supporting the Angel Tree Project with Prison Fellowship, where they buy gifts for you know, the children mm. whose parents are incarcerated. This year we're doing Christmas hampers yeah. uh, you know, into some of the housing commission units and hostels. Well, they're all they're, they're right behind it financially. Um, they we, we also do work uh, with the West End Community House, so they have an emer- emergency food pantry there. And uh, so, if you're a lot of people under stress at the moment with rents going up, but this uh, pantry is 24 hour access. So if you're desperate, you can go in there and take food out of the pantry. And so every business network meeting I go to, I come home with two or three bags of groceries because when they go shopping now, they know what we do, wow. they buy it. And then I put that with what we collect in the church and go and fill the pantry, you know, whenever we can. Mm. Now, when do you think you live in the dream? It's, yeah. Look, I, I consider myself and my wife and I talk about it quite often, how blessed we are to be doing what we do. Yeah. You know, to, to wake up in, in, in a, a... It's like, you know... Yeah, we could just be living, we have a little townhouse on the north side of Brisbane. We could be living there, but we get to live in like both worlds and we get to do what we we love doing. We love West End, loved, uh, you know, I just, I think I'm in my sweet spot just walking down Boundary Street. <laughs> this is the flourishing life. This is the flourishing <laughs> life, yeah. <That's> it, yeah. <laughs> um, don't be embarrassed by this, but, but when, when your name comes up, people say, he's a pastor's pastor, he's... A, a real pastor, people can see your genuine love and care for people. H- how do you see the role of pastor and as shepherd, Glenn? Mm. Um, look, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, maybe we have complicated a little bit, and I think with the corporatization of the church, I think we have complicated the role of pastor. Because, you know, if, hey, if you hit uh, First Peter chapter 5, it's quite clear. Um, and I think when Peter's, you know, saying, you know, shepherd the flock <laughs> of God, Peter knew exactly what that meant. You know, Peter would have been very familiar with Ezekiel 34 yeah. and uh, the Lord's rebuke on the shepherds of Israel mm. because of what they weren't doing. Yeah. And I think the role of a pastor is, is the role of that, uh, the shepherd, which is, it's protecting the flock. You know, it's, it's feeding the flock, you know, giving them more water, giving them food, or giving them shelter. It's rebuking the flock and, you know, correcting uh, those who need correcting. But it's, it's like the, the role of a pastor is to, 
and, and there's ways to do it. Uh, there's, there's qualifications, I think, for pastors and elders and shepherds and overseers as well. But I think exactly how the shepherds looked after the sheep is how mm. that's the role of a pastor today, but we're doing it for people. So we're, we're making sure that they're, they're fed. We're making sure that they're being taught well. We're making sure that we're equipping them. You know, I said last week that a, you know, number one on a pastor's job description is help Christians to suffer well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and and it's a reality. Uh, oh, that's what we do. So it's preparing. You know, it's preparing uh, our churches, preparing our people to to thrive in a hostile world, and the world is becoming increasingly more hostile towards Christians and towards the church. Yep, back when I was growing up, you know, fifties, sixties, seventies. I think, uh, yeah, the glory days. <laughs> you know, most people adhered to, you know, what we, you know, the Judeo-Christian, values, uh, I yeah. guess, worldview and, and values. But that's very different today. Yeah. And because we can't change what we believe, because we believe the Lord directs us in a certain way and what we live and what we believe and doctrine and theology informs that, um, we're going to be, you know, it, it's going to be tougher on the sheep. <laughs> it's going to be tougher on the flock. It's going to be tougher on the church. So... I know pastors have to do a whole lot of other things, but primarily this is our core business. This is our key business. And I think it's confusing for people when we, we kind of hand out titles here, pastors everywhere, and then those people aren't pastoring because people think, oh, they've got the title, but yeah. it must have changed or something. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and again, Peter's quite clear again in, in 1 Peter 5 about what they look like. Well, the the shepherds are to do it willingly, so it's like not a duty. You're doing it at a delight. You know, you do it because you love. You can people. see it coming out of you. Like in one of our, um, we run a preaching intensive mm-hmm. every two years, and mm-hmm. we get you to come in. Mm-hmm. That's one of the students' favourite sections when you come in because you you talk to them about how to do a wedding well and mm-hmm. how to do a funeral mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. and even the mm-hmm. funeral of someone who's committed suicide. Yes. The students mm-hmm. love that you give them mm-hmm. a sample. Mm-hmm sermon Mm -hmm. so your desire Mm -hmm. to impart to next generation Mm -hmm. and i think what they do is they catch who you are the Mm -hmm. love for people Mm -hmm. at these wonderful moments of marital union but Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. too in the darkest days Mm -hmm. and you're Mm -hmm. helping almost like informally pastoring those who attend the funerals Mm -hmm. like it's wedding season for you at the moment isn't it it? is yeah three weddings in the next uh (laughs) Two and a half, three weeks. Funeral next week as well. <laughs> so three weddings and a funeral. Three weddings and a funeral. <laughs> boom, yes. boom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so why then, why have you given your life mm. to, 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 to work for God, to be a pastor? Um, well, yeah, I, I think as Christians we all, we all give our lives to God. You know, like I've got a, a, a guy, Steve, lovely man, um, who's a cleaner, and... Uh, and he just loves the Lord so much. And he gets out in Boundary Street and he's handing out tracks and he's sharing his faith and he gets excited and, you know, speaking to the guy who heads up one of the bikey gangs and, you know, and he's in there and, and that's the call of God, you know, on his life yeah. and he's thriving. You know, I've got a, a guy, he's a financial, uh, you know, consultant who loves the Lord and uh, is always trying to bring something of, of, of his faith you know, to his clients and what is that? That's the call of God, and uh, so I, I, you know, I again, I love what I do, as you know, Gavin loves being a you know a financial consultant, and Steve loves being a you know a cleaner, and then preaching on the streets and and whatnot. Um, so I don't see that what I do any as any different to them or any more valuable. Um, for me, it's like I'm just excited by the fact that I get to do what I love. <laughs> in the same way that they do. And I think that should be every Christian. Yeah. You know, every Christian should be, you know, uh, 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 see themselves as being sent. You know, we're all missionaries in that sense. It's the core business of the church, isn't it? You know, to go out into all the world to make disciples. And uh, when I see people in the church doing that, I just love that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and to hear their stories about how they're encountering people, they're praying for people uh, and doing all of that. <laughs> so when I think about the call of God, for me, I don't see it as any different than anyone else in yeah. the church. Uh, it's just that, yeah, I've got a defined role as, as a leader, as a shepherd, as a pastor. And, uh, you know, why why do I give my life to that? You know, there was uh, Leonard Ravenhill, you know, wrote a great book yeah. on revival. And I remember 
many years ago reading one of the stories in there about a guy called Charlie Peace. Charlie Peace was late 1800s as a criminal, was uh, sentenced to death. And so Charlie's walking to the gallows and there's a, an Anglican priest walking with him, reading from a, the Book of Consolation and he's reading about hell. This is what hell is going to be like, which must have been really encouraging for Charlie Peace. And Charlie Peace said, uh, you know, Reverend, if I believe that, if the church believed that, then, you know, I would crawl across all of England on broken glass to get one person, save one person, you know, from that, the hell that you're talking about. And I would think it would be a worthwhile occupation to do it. And uh, I boom, thought, isn't that true? <laughs> hey, how much more for us? You know, I get to see people come to the Lord in what I yeah. do. I get to see people grow in their faith. And uh, it's worthwhile. You know, it, it's worthwhile. I did hear, you know, I've heard that saying, you know, if, if you, you know, if God calls you to be a, a pastor, don't stoop to be a king. And I don't really like that. John Lewis was the first person I ever heard say that. <laughs> well, that's probably where and, I heard it. And it just resonated through me. I don't like it. <laughs> oh, because it, it was because, a game changer because, for me. Because I think whatever God has called you yeah, to, yeah, okay, yeah. you know, don't stoop to be yeah. a king. If it's a cleaner, sharing your faith in boundary street or a financial consultant or working in yeah. NDIS or whatever, if that's what God has called you to, don't stoop to be a king. Yeah. yeah. I'm loving this. Like we get to share the gospel, we get yeah. to preach the gospel, mm. we act to embody the gospel. Talk talk to me a little bit more about the uniqueness and power of the gospel and, and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. Well, you have to understand what the gospel is, I guess. Hey? Yeah. Because you know we use the word and within the Christian context, there's so many words we use and we use them so frequently that they can lose their power and their meaning. But, you know, when we talk about the gospel, I always get back to Isaiah. <laughs> you know, how, how beautiful you know, are the feet of those that bring good news. You know, the, I, Isaiah says that. And then he talks about what that good news looks like, and uh, w- which I think is powerful. He talks about the suffering servant. And so that's that aspect of the gospel where uh, Jesus, the suffering servant, died vicariously on the cross on our behalf. And because of the atonement, because of his shed blood, um, you know, our, our, our sins uh, are wiped away from us eternally and uh, God's wrath is placated uh, because of that. And that's that element of the gospel. And some, sometimes people think about that and that's all the gospel is. But Isaiah goes to, you know, move on. He talks about, you know, the barren woman. You know, sing, O barren woman. <laughs> um, you know, you who haven't had children. And that's another aspect of the gospel where we're not only saved, we're, we're redeemed, we're, we're rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought in the kingdom of the son that he loves. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But then our identity is determined by God. You know, the barren woman in that culture had no reason to sing. And she's thinking, what the heck are you talking about? If I can't have kids, I'm nothing. If I can't have children, to more children to... To, to work in the fields, if I can't produce sons to protect all our assets, if I can't do that, like Rachel, give mm. me children or, or I I'll die. die yeah. Because for a woman in that culture, that Middle Eastern culture, your ability to have children was everything. Mm. Uh, and this woman couldn't have it and God comes to sing, oh barren woman, because you know, hey, your father's the Lord. <laughs> and uh, a really important part of the gospel, it, yes, the atonement, we're saved because of the, the shed blood of Jesus, but we have new identities. And so then our identities aren't determined by what we do. Our identities aren't determined by what people say about us. Our identities aren't determined by the jobs we do or the amount of money that we have. Our, our identities are determined by who God says we are. And, you know, at the beginning of Matthew, Jesus goes down to the river, gets baptised. He hasn't done anything yet. Yeah. You know, he hasn't done anything. He's just been, you know, hanging out for 33 years. Then he gets baptised and the heavens open up. The Holy Spirit comes down. The Father speaks. Behold, this is my son who I love and I'm well pleased. I think it's Tom Wright. He says that what the Father spoke over Jesus, he speaks over every believer every day. And uh, so the gospel of being saved, we didn't deserve it. There's nothing we can add to it, but we have this free gift. Our identities are changed and we are who God says we are, not who the, what the world says. And then, of course, 
the next important part, Isaiah goes in to talk about the the the, the city of precious jewels, the one that's in ruins, but mm. it can be, and that's the hope of glory in our hearts. You know, not only are we we saved and rescued and redeemed, not only are our identities kind of completely changed a, a, and reshaped by who God says we are, but now we have the hope of glory. One day, we're going to shuffle off this mortal coil. You know, the trap door beneath us is going to open. We're going to fall, and we're going to fall into the presence of, of Jesus, and. We're going to be a part of the, the new heavens and the new earth. Man, that's this, the gospel. This is our future hope. This, this is, is our present hope. hope. This is it. This is it. This is, this is the glory. You know, in the midst of all of our trials, in the yeah. midst of, of suffering, in the midst of hardship, we have the hope of glory in our hearts. Yeah. That is so inspiring. So, so powerful. Now, you've got a real passion to see uh, people experience the love, love of Jesus. How have you seen this happen uh, over the length of your ministry, and how do you see this continuing to happen? Mm. Yeah, it's um, I probably have a little bit of a different view and approach of it now than you know. I was one of those ones nearly forty years ago. I put up my hand at the end of the service. You know, yeah. oh, you're a Christian now, um, and I, I think that I think the putting up of the hand, the raising the hand, signals something. I don't know that's necessarily it could have happened before then, or it might happen after, but. You know, what I've seen, uh, Andrew, a little bit in, in N Church anyway, um, man, we had a prayer meeting last night and there's a guy there. And this guy, 12 months ago, Daniel, you know Daniel, yeah. who we, we met the other yeah. night at Tom Holland. Um, Daniel rings me and says, hey, mate, I got this guy. He's an atheist. Uh, and he's asking all these big questions. Would you sit down and have a coffee with him? I said, yeah. So he brings him along. We have a coffee together in West End and, you know, this guy's in his 60s, you know, was a high flyer, uh, worked for Mojo, you know, as a, um, you know, in, in marketing and promotion and all that, and, and, uh, but has never believed, has considered himself to be an atheist, had just found out that he, he, he's got Jewish heritage. <laughs> so in his 60s, and, um, but he, he, and he's met this woman, you know, who's a sold out, born again believer, and uh, he started to ask questions. So I said, well, mate, you know, come along. So he came along. I invited him into a new Christians course we were doing. Then he came into a discipleship course. And it's just been a, this, you know, he's been learning. And I, I've tried not to put pressure on him yeah, about yeah. anything. And last night he prayed in this prayer meeting. And I tell you what, we were all in tears because it was just like he's talking to God like he thinks he can hear him. Yeah. <laughs> but he just said, God, you know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm feeling, but... Man, I want to thank you for all, all that's happening and all these people and you know it's just <laughs> like, and uh, I, I, I just how good is it to be a part of that? Yeah, and to see that happen, you know, I, I get a bit emotional even thinking about him praying last night, and I think yeah. we all felt it because we've all been on the journey with him, you know, and uh, it's just been amazing. I said, and then he started telling us how he's sharing his faith, you mm. know, with 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 his brother and some people he's working with. And I said, mate, I said, you know, there's a church in the States. I don't know who it was, but the mission statement is from atheists to missionaries. I said, you've just fulfilled that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, he's getting quite excited about And it's like, why didn't I come to this earlier? Why didn't I find it? Why didn't someone tell me about this? You know? so there's the power of the gospel yes, and also yeah. the power of the life-giving community, yeah. the local church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything comes back to the church, yeah. Andrew. Um, you know, it's if the church is not functioning well, and hey, is there any church that functions yeah. perfect? No, there's not. Um, and if you find it, you know the old joke: don't join it because you're wrecking. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think that you know the thing. Uh, I think anyone in my church will, if if you said, "What's Pastor Glenn's favourite scripture?" They'll say, "Oh, uh, be devoted to one another in brotherly, sisterly love. Honour one another above yourselves." Yeah. And I. I speak that out all the time. I preach that all the time because I believe that if we could, can you imagine that? A church where we are devoted to one another, yeah. devoted to one another, where we're honouring one another above ourselves. Man, if we could get that, if we could model that, we'd have to lock the doors because we couldn't get enough people. Because we've got a relationship handbook. 
if we live that out, we should be experts in relationship, conflict resolution. Even Colossians, sure. it says, make allowances for each other yeah, in yeah. advance. Yes, so yeah. anticipate the shortcomings yeah. of exactly. each other exactly. and make allowances. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing that. You've been doing that for years for me, haven't yeah. you? <laughs> well, I think it goes two yeah. ways. But that notion of uh, you know, <clears throat> devoted to one another. Yeah. So Rick Warren who said, uh, you know, because if you look at all the one another's in the New yeah. Testament, you know, the, the main mission, uh, the main function of the church is one anothering one another. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that uh, because I think it's true. Because, you know, you, you, you can't sideline the church. Mm. You know, you can't, you, the church is so completely important for the extension of the kingdom, for the development of, of our faith, for discipling people. You know, if you're out there as a lone ranger, um, what do you do if you share your faith with someone? You yeah. know, what does it look like then to be a Christian? Is yeah. it just living you know, individually by yourself, which is part of our you know, Western culture and that Western philosophy, the self is all important, you know, you do you. Yeah. <laughs> um, where it, 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 you, you can't, you know, there's no context in the New Testament for Christians apart from the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to speak it up. You know, we, I think we do talk down the church even christians talk down you know the church and you can't do it i often use that analogy of you know imagine andrew if i invited you over to dinner with maureen and i and you know you hadn't met her before but we we'd met and you come over we have a nice dinner and uh have a good time have a few laughs and then you know the next day you give me a call and say hey glenn i really loved last night the only thing is i really don't like your wife and that's what we're saying. We say, yeah, hey, Jesus, I love you. I just don't like your bride. Yeah. I mean, how does he feel about that? Because yeah. I know how I'd feel if you said that about Maureen. <laughs> and if I said that about your wife, yeah. I know how you'd feel too. <laughs> um, and yet that's what we say about Jesus also yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Well, we like you, but we don't like your church. Mm. Her name's Jeanne, because I know most blokes think, how do I say it? Do I say her name right? I think it's Jeanne. 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 Yeah, Jeanne. 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 Thank you, Parmesan. <laughs> there you go, Parmesan. Now you've quoted, Shout out to you, Parmesan. You've quoted... You've quoted um, <laughs> a few books on the way through. You're like you're one thing I rate, Glenn, is you're a learned man, but you've done, you've worked hard for your learning, um, and even the fact someone, you know, give a r- ring and said, "Can you talk to this guy about mm-hmm. faith?" Mm-hmm. So you spend a lot of time preparing yourself. One thing I rate about you, Glenn, is that you're both spiritful and skillful. So you've done the journey over many decades of preparation. You want to talk about some of the big ideas ran your preparation, and even you had a couple of stints of higher ed in there along mm, the way, yeah? Mm, mm, mm. Um, well, again, it wasn't until I'd become a Christian that I realised that, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn and I wanted to study. And I went into, in those years, about 1986, and I went into a Bible college, a college of ministry. It was a certificate of ministry. It was a one-year um, it didn't, you know, the, you, you, in those days you didn't get accreditation or anything. It was just the local church issued a system, mm. but it was great. It was an absolute, under Charles New, Pastor Charles Newington, who was just, you know, he, he, he's legend. a great teacher. He's a legend. And he really stirred me up. And then I, I went to another college in Jubilee College. And uh, there was one particular lecture there, a, a woman, a young woman. And she would still today be the best teacher that I've ever sat under. Um, her ministry was like, it was encouraging, it was um, impactful. Uh, it, she knew what she was talking about when it came to the word, to scriptures, to theology, to doctrine. And yet she built you up to such a level, I thought, hang on, maybe I'm not as thick as I thought I was and maybe I could go to uni. So all after I think I did a diploma of Christian ministry there, and then I thought, well, you know, there is a thing called mature age entry. So I think I'm going to apply to one of the universities. And there were two, uh, Australian Catholic Uni or Griffith University. At that stage, would take people to do a bachelor's degree. And I always wanted to do history and English. And um, at that stage, ACU was just down the road mm. in Mitchelton. So I applied, got in. And uh, so my first uh, my f- my bachelor's degree was in, uh, I did three majors, uh, English, History and Asian Studies. But the history was really church history <laughs> mm. uh, because the, uh, the, the uh, professor who headed up history was a church historian. He had a particular uh, interest in uh, the church under National Socialism under mm. Hitler in the Second World War. And uh, so church history was all European history. 
so I fell in love even more so with church history, with history. That's with, where you get English. the passion from. From it those, from came that. From that. It came from that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you get to do all sorts of eclectic studies, whether it was on modernism in the fourth century, you know, early church or, the, you know, the church. Church under, fathers, the church patristics. Church fathers, yeah. patristics, the, ch- the church under Hitler, national socialism. So you just never know what, what subject you can, you're going to get. So... I, I just love that. And uh, in the Asian studies, the English, it, it just, it was, uh, I was, when I got to university, I just loved it so much and I couldn't believe, you know. It was like, I, I remember this one day, this is a very personal experience. So I went to uni at 35, I think, <laughs> and um, I was doing English literature and we're doing, um, doing romantic poets from England and we had a nun from Boston uh, University who was doing a bit of a sabbatical and she was uh, an English lit, you know, uh, uh, um, had a PhD in English literature. And I remember sitting in this little tutorial group with this with this nun and the stuff we were talking about, you know, some of the Christian poets and things like that. And I'm just like, I think, wow, wow, look at that. Did he mean that, you know? And uh, it was just like amazing and I thought myself so blessed to be in this yeah. place and I remember walking out going walking through the car park of uh, the Catholic Uni at Mitchelton it was a lovely day sun shining and I started to get angry you know with myself and it was like God I could have been here when I was 17 or 18 doing this mm. it's like I wasted all these years and now I'm 35 and 20 <laughs> years ago you know why wasn't I in that place and I really felt, the Lord didn't speak to me, but it, it was so clear that I had this impression, you have every right to get angry if this is all there is. Ah. And it was like, bang. It was one of those, what? And then I thought, it doesn't matter if I don't do a PhD until I'm 85. Yeah. Um, because again, this is, you know, the life that comes a continuation of here, I yeah. believe in the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to be studying. You know, I believe we're going to be learning. And it doesn't matter at what point. You know, I love it, you know, when I go into Bible college and see people there in the 70s and 80s. I loved your mum. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I lectured her a couple yeah. of times at, uh, yeah. at Christian Heritage College at CMC. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, how exciting is that? Yeah. A- and I think we should all have that view that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter when you come to it, but when you come to it, go for it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I love that. Then you went and did a master's. You I did, well, I did a uh, teaching degree first. Oh, I that's a, right. I did a diploma in education at DPED at QUT, again in history and English to become yeah. a secondary teacher. And then after that, I, um, I, I did a master, uh, an MA, Master of Arts, again back at the Catholic yeah. University. So I started at the Catholics, went to QUT, went back to the Catholic University, and largely because of one of the lecturers there. Um, who was a Christian brother, a brother Alan Moss. And Alan just loved the Old Testament. I mean, he had about five or six languages, and I guess yeah. if you're a priest or a Christian brother, what else you got to do but learn languages? And uh, he was an amazing uh, uh, scholar. Um, and he, he loved the Old Testament, loved Judaism. So I went and did a, a Master of Arts, which was, uh, it was all coursework at that stage. Mm. But it was all focused on Old Testament, Judaism and church history, <laughs> again. That's why we've been so able to lecture in Old and New Testament for us too. You come in yes, and yeah, we helped David Quack out, remember that? That's yeah, right, that yeah, was, yeah. I love both of it. So I did the, uh, I did the um, yeah, finished the MA. And again, I'm working as a pastor and all that too. But again, I loved it. I just loved uh, that study. And so I wanted to, I didn't know what to do. Um, and then after that, I, I kind of ended up doing a, a Master of Theology with, uh, it was then called the Brisbane College of the- Theology, which was the St. Paul's, yeah. um, the Catholic, the uh, Trinity from the United Church yeah. and St. Francis uh, Anglican, all got together to, to kind of issue that Master's of Theology. Mm. And you did a paper on the theophanies of God, wasn't it? Like uh, about encounter? One of the independent studies yeah. I did was yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, theophanies of the Pentateuch. So the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and just studied uh, theophanies. Yeah, yeah. Appearances of God. Appearances yeah, I think you, God. you taught me this, that the first thing the angel always said was, fear not. Fear not. <laughs> fear not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment of encounter. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, the... 
the um, some of the critics, um, and I'm not saying critics in a negative sense, but you know, people are some of the scholars come to like different different uh, situations within scripture, and they say that they look at and there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. So within the theophany, which is just appearance of God, um, in theophanies, they all of them have similarities. Yeah. So just about all of them commence with, yeah, fear not. So they alleviate fear. <laughs> they all have the words of salvation. Yeah. They all have some kind of yeah. direction. And really, it's like it, 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 all of those characteristics of what we do as ministers and what we do as Christians. We kind of, you know, we come into people's lives who are overcome with fear. And why don't we say fear not? Fear not yeah. you know? Don't be and anxious. We give them the way of salvation. Yeah. There's always those comforting words and those <laughs> ways of salvation. It's always, you know, theophanies are not something that... Uh, you know, people can generate. They just happen. Yeah. And so, you know, people can't choose them. So when you look at the wow. uh, from the form critics, yeah. uh, look at the form of the offices and the different characteristics, oh, actually, this is what we're called to do. Yeah. Well, thank you for your diligence because it has added a skillful dimension to what you do. Can you quickly summarise what's the, what's the importance of good doctrine or having good theology or at least mm. have thought through some of those, mm. the great tenets of our faith? Well, it's... You know, good doctrine and good theology is important on a number of levels, I think, Andrew. One, it, it, it gives you an entry way into the Scripture um, because the, you know, the, the Bible is written as a narrative. You know, it's a story. It's that one story we talk about, the cre- story of creation, the fall, the story of redemption and consummation, everything that is to come. And wherever you are in the Scripture, you're in one part of that story. Sometimes you can be in a couple of parts. Mm. But it, it is the, the story from creation from the beginning to you know, the second coming of Christ. So it's not written in terms of like a, a systematic yeah. th- uh, Like a theology, textbook of theology, textbook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can't just say, oh... I'm just going to grab the Bible. I want to find out about the atonement. So, yeah. you know, so theology and doctrine, and uh, I love theologians, <laughs> um, and I love them because, you know, they go and do all the hard yards. Yeah. So they will go and look at, you know, where, where, where is the atonement, you know, evidence? Is it, where is it in Leviticus? Where is it, you know, right through? And then they put that together. So theology and doctrine give you an easy entryway into the Scripture. So you, anything that you want to know, you know, pneumatology, what's the, what's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, or whatever, ecclesiology. I, thought of, I, I did some study way back when I was 21. Yeah. I thought Holy Spirit was first mentioned in the book of Acts. Until, uh, yeah, until the lecturer yeah. says, go, Genesis. turn to yeah. Genesis 1, Andrew. Exactly. Yeah. Holy Spirit was there. Hovering. And my yeah. mind was blown, but yeah. it's Acts. Acts of Holy yeah. Spirit, that's his yeah. book. No. That's it, that's true. Yeah. That, yeah. No, that's just when he was yeah. let out of the box. Mm. That, that yeah. true. So they, so it gives you that entry way into the scripture and to understand, which we need for discipleship. Um, yeah. You know, we need that for discipleship. I think it also it uh, it's there to protect the church, uh, because there are a whole lot of things under attack nowadays, um, even within the church, coming from within, the, and probably has been for a long time. Well, the but Apostle Paul said, "Watch out, watch out for yep. false teachings. Yeah. Guard yeah. your doctrine closely." Exactly, exactly. So you have to know what your doctrine is before you can. Guard it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think you know, theology, systematic theology, biblical theology, you know, doctrine. It, 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 you know, th- and that's what the creeds were all about, weren't they? You know, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. You know, they were written at times where people there was a very low level of literacy, and so someone said, okay, what are the key elements of doctrine? What are the key elements of theology yeah. that? Um, before we can baptise you, that you must agree with these. When we baptise people, uh, we all gather around and we recite the Nicene Creed together. Yeah. Because when I say, I'm, you know, on the confession of your faith, well, I want to know what they believe. Yeah. Do you believe you know, in the Trinity? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Do you believe Spirit. in that? Yeah, exactly, in the Incarnation. Do you believe in the Second Coming? Do you believe in all these things? Because if you do, then I can baptise you. Because I'm, I'm baptising you into the church, but I'm baptising you into yeah. a body of belief as well. And you're saying, yes, I, I agree to this. So theology and doctrine, you know, they, they help us produce things like the creeds um, and our you know, statements of faith and things like that, which, again, it's like they were necessary... Because there's a lot of people saying, no, we don't believe that, we don't believe that, we don't believe that. And then the church could come and say, well, this is what we do believe and this is a simple statement of it. And in some ways, doctrine and theology is that. So it gives us an entryway into, you know, the scriptures. It uh, protects the church from what we're doing. And then 
it's transformative, isn't it? Your your little story about the Holy Spirit finding him in Genesis. Oh. You know, theology and doctrine it transforms us. Yeah. Um, and man, I you know, I've read different theologians. I, I remember first encountering Alistair McGrath. You know, and uh, his book on theology, wow. and man, it changed. The lights it, come it, on. It, 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 oh, wow, I've never seen it like that. And I love how he did it. He he'd do you know whatever the doctrine was and the theology, and then he'd have a section in it. And this is how the church has viewed this historically. Yeah. You know, and every and it was just like because I love history. So like, oh yes, thank it's God so for all. his his discipline. Like oh. I remember doing some just. When you learn, when you're trained to read the Word of God theologically mm. And, mm. and know where your sources are, what mm. your favourite sources are, mm. Mm. then you then you see the grand narratives of the 66 books of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where I come up. I had a revelation yeah. of the flourishing life, yes. hence the name yeah. of this podcast. Because yeah. you know, people would say God's a cosmic killjoy mm. who just controls lightning yeah. rods yeah. from heaven. But yeah. when you understand the grand narrative, He's That's got a true. plan for a flourishing life, it's, a yeah, life exactly. that we can live mm. maximised. Then issues mm. like sexuality and gender mm. all are a subset of this grand narrative of true, god yeah. has got a life of obedience and, ha- and flourishing yeah. and mm. it uh, and even um great strength and consolation under deep mm. suffering mm. that's true this is the flourishing and life it's the flourishing life and you know people like alistair mcgrath you know they i i first encountered <laughs> him it, it wasn't in his book of theology it was on calvin uh, I was doing a specialised study on John Calvin and the Reformation and I came across this book that was just <laughs> easy to read and informative and it was uh, McGrath's book on uh, yeah, Calvin yeah, wow. and the Reformation. And then I started to find out that he'd written about science, he'd written about um, you know, history, he'd written about theology and I think, is there anything, and apologetics, you know, yeah. one of my favourite books on apologetics was Bridge Building by, by Alistair McGrath. Yeah. And uh, I thought, man, where does this guy... You know, and aren't we blessed in the body of Christ to have people like Tom Wright, Alistair McGrath, these these great theologians who are so gifted to do theology and doctrine, all with a deep and love for Jesus, and eh? yeah, yeah, who love Jesus, yeah, yeah passionately, <laughs> and that comes across. And you know, I, I little side story, yeah. I know a guy who went on a mission trip with Alistair McGrath to China, um, and uh, it was the last night. And they were all going out to celebrate. And this guy went up to Alistair, was in his room. He hadn't come down. Alistair, we're all going out. Are you coming? Oh, I've just got an idea for a book. I just want to sit here and put some notes down. And, uh, okay, well, we'll see you at breakfast. So they went, they went out and did what they did, came back at breakfast. They're, 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 they're having breakfast. And he hadn't come down to go up. And he'd been up all night writing a book and largely footnoting it from memory. Wow. And I'm thinking, man... How good what is a gift, it? What a gift to the body of Christ. Yeah. People like this. Yeah. And uh, that's what I love about what you do, uh, you know, at, at, at CHC, is you get to expose young people to, you know, we don't have to do, do all the work ourselves. And there's these great people who've gone before us and we kind of, you know, stand on their shoulders, don't sound we? sound like the Wesleyan quadrilateral now. We take go. the tradition. Oh, I love that. Experience. Yeah. Hey, yep. um, one yep. thing I love about theology, because ours is the spirit-filled sort of theology mm. lane, what's been amazing in the last decade, even the amount of new Pentecostal spirit-filled mm. theology mm. books mm. that are coming through. Mm. Um, we're kind of an action-orientated um, oral tradition, we do a lot of speaking, mm. a lot of doing, but not a lot of writing. Mm-hmm. So there's been a group that the second generation of Pentecostal mm. theologians mm. are coming through. So you and I got to interact with some of those resources mm. recently. Like you were asked to do a presentation on um, the distinctives. Around what, what's a spirit-filled expression of a of a mm. worship service a worship at a Bible service, college yeah. recently? Yeah. Do you want to yeah. tell us about sort of what you found and some of the elements of that? Yeah, well, it was a really interesting thing. It was... Uh, yeah, it, it, it's not within the Australian Christian churches, so it's a, it's a reformed a reformed Bible college, uh, which I have a little bit to do with. Mm. Um, my son actually went to that same college and did his Bachelor of Theology there, uh, so I had a little bit to do with them there. But yeah, it was lovely to get the invitation to come in because they were it was they were doing a unit on worship, and it was you know Anglican worship and you know, Presbyterian worship and all, all the different Catholic worship. And I was asked to come in and, and talk about a Pentecostal service, which I thought was just a, you know, a great honour to do that. Um, and, uh, and 
went in and got to talk about how we put our services together, what they look like, our you know worship and what what that looks like, and our kind of I guess our thinking and theology behind that, uh, you know our prayer, our you know coming around the uh, the communion table, uh, our message, how we put that together, you know how it comes out. So it was uh, it was a great experience and really well received too, um, and they were just a great group great group of students and it was just a delight and an honour. Uh, I felt quite humble. Well, it must have been be good because they've the vast you back but it went like the questions you had was amazing because people were inspired by your insights and revelation were trying to work out how, what elements can we adopt now into yeah. our liturgy. Well, isn't that all young people don't? That's what I love about young people. It's like they, you know, what can what can we take from this? You know, yeah. and that was great. And there was a lot of young people there preparing for ministry, and too, I think um, it doesn't matter where you are in the church. You know, you have to see the level of engagement uh, of people in in Pentecostal for yeah, worship. It is a phenomenon, you know, isn't it? Is, it is, yeah. and it's like where their hands are up. You know, hearts are out. We're all there. And uh, there's something quite powerful in that. What I love about a spirit-filled liturgy or expression is it's a couple of E's. Like, here's a good Pentecostal alliteration. Like, we have an expectancy mm -hmm. that God is going to speak to us. Yeah, yeah. He's mm -hmm. going to move. Mm -hmm. So there's an expectancy. It's, um, we, do, we do focus a lot on experience. Mm -hmm. So God's not a cerebral God for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. He's real and we can experience him. Mm -hmm. We can feel. Mm -hmm. We can feel love and we can... Yeah. feel mm. peace mm. and there's mm. a lot of engagement well, here's another e engagement mm. like mm. you can't hide often in a spirit-filled mm. service mm. even though, reach out your hand to that reach out we're going to pray yeah, true, reach true. out your yeah. hand for yes. that yeah. come yeah. forward respond yeah. to that and even to <laughs> our, our phenomena around the altar call we expect mm. a response to the word of god now this mm. having said that now you, you this is your chance to respond to this i, I love that mm. you can't mm. hide or mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it can be quite scary for people just oh, coming totally. in. Oh, totally. I mean, I was terrified first time I went into same, one of those being, being raised as a Catholic. I was, <laughs> yeah, it was like, whoa. But at least with <laughs> Catholic, God, the Catholic faith, at least you're wide up for encounter, aren't you? Like there is an expectation um, that God yeah, is there. I, I never got that at, at, oh, at the stage okay. I was there. It was more about this is just stuff you had to do. Yeah, oh, and okay. uh, yeah, it wasn't anything I look forward to. Uh, you know, it was if I could hide in my shoes and not go to church. <laughs> uh, my mother would still take me along and make me go barefoot, but anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, you've been involved too, because you've been decades of ministry, the development of young leaders and pastors. Mm -hmm. So, if you were to go back, because um, we have got a, a big pocket of younger younger mm. listeners on mm. this podcast, so they'll be listening, Glenn. Mm. You're, you're like you're in your 60s. Definitely you don't look like you're in your 60s. You're in good good shape for your age. Like what, what would you think are some of the essentials for a young leader or, or someone trying to discern uh, the call of God and how that's going to work out sure, in their life? Sure. A couple of essentials? Yeah. Well, I think there are four essentials. <laughs> oh, four. <laughs> These four you prepared earlier, there's, are they? There's a, whole, no, there's a lot of other stuff. <laughs> But I think there are four. Uh, if I'm yeah. looking, if I'm looking for someone, yeah. or they're they're asking me about, you know, maybe you know ministry or whatever, or not just ministry service in the church. Uh, I think there are a, a number of things that leaders look for, and really, if any of those are missing, the journey is going to be problematic in, in some mm. way, shape, or form. You know, I, I think they've got to be faithful. You know, the first thing that. I look at it in, in people coming and particularly people who are expressing an interest in ministry is that, well, you're going to be faithful. <laughs> you know, are you going to come whether you feel like it or not? You know, are you going to come because you know that uh, you mightn't feel like being in church, but you're mm. going to be there because you know that your presence adds something to the community of faith? Uh, if I give you something to do, are you going to do it? You know, if I ask you to, you know, to do something, can I trust you with it? So that faithfulness with the little things, you know, like will you be there on time? Yeah. Uh, are you going to walk in 10 minutes late? Because if you are, not really me, you're disrespecting, you're disrespecting the church, I think, the, the community, the church, but you're really disres disrespecting the Lord. Um, is this important for you <laughs> or not? So that faithfulness, I think, um, I think attitude, good attitude. Yeah, you got to. Uh, if, if someone hasn't got a good attitude, then they're going to pull things down. They're going to talk against things. They're going to white ant you. 
they're going to white hat the you know the, the projects the church or whatever so i want them with yeah a level of faithfulness with an attitude that's good servant hearted i mean yeah. it all starts there yeah. you know, jesus philippians chapter 2 he humbled himself yeah. and became a servant and that was it you know you know I, i'm here to serve you <laughs> And I'm calling you to do the same thing. So, are you prepared to serve? Because a lot of people say, "Yeah, like, yeah, I'll give it." Yeah, notional assent. Uh, yeah, I, I'm here to serve. Yeah. But okay, can I can I ask you to go and empty out the coffee? Yeah. yeah. Hang on, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Um, and that you know, servanthood is servanthood. You know, it, it is that you're there to serve your brothers and sisters. You're, there. you're not there to serve the pastor. Mm. You're there to serve the church. Um, and mm. and I, I see a, a big difference there. Sometimes mm. I think some of the churches get a little <laughs> bit wild when they say it's all about the pastor. It's not. Um, it's about serving the church. So if they haven't got servanthood, they're, they're really going to struggle, yeah. I, I think. So faithfulness, attitude that's good, servant-hearted and teachable. Yeah, Are they teachable? So I'm looking for fast leaders, Andrew. Faithful, attitude, oh, that's good. Oh. and teachable. This is a real spirit. You're a real spiritful pastor. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got an acronym yeah. going there for yeah. us. Well, it used to be fat. You know, yeah. faithful, <laughs> attitude, teachable. We you know, kind of throw in servanthood there because it's pretty important. <laughs> oh, but massive, it also, it's, uh, massive. doesn't offend anyone either. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, teachableness <laughs> is really important too. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I had a young guy with me for a while and, you know, he, he, I was helping him to preach, uh, learn how to preach and giving his advice. And I remember first or second time he said to me, listen, um, I'm new at this and I'm looking at you. you. You've been doing this for a long time and so I'm going to defer to you on this matter and I'm taking on board what you said. Wow. I can work with that. Yeah. You know, I can work with that. It's when, no, you don't understand. This is something that has to be preached about. You know, I, I said this and, you know, you can't tell me what to say. So that's not teachable. So someone who, who, who's got a, a, a level of teachability. I'm not saying you have to agree with everything, but you've got to be teachable. Yeah. So I think if you've got those, uh, if, if I'm looking for to bring someone in, uh, someone into leadership, I'm looking at those four things yeah. for a start. Because you can always add content and doctrine and theology to that later on. Or what's, what's terrible is having people who are trained, who've done the time, say, <coughs> high ready to prepare themselves, but they're not teachable. No. They don't have a servant no. attitude. They yeah. cry. Yeah. They just butcher people in the pulpit. Exactly. That's yeah. terrible. It's awful. Yeah. Go, with, go yeah. with Glenn. Go with fast. Yeah. F-A-S-T. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and maybe do a fast before you respond to the call of God. Boom, boom. Come We're on. getting the spiritual yeah. disciplines now. <laughs> now, look, things haven't always been perfect for mm. your Maureen and your beautiful mm. tribe. Of mm. kids that you've got, mm. um, what, what do you what do you do in tough seasons? H- how do you approach mm. that? Because you said right at the beginning, part of, part of a job of, of a pastor is to teach people how to suffer well. Yeah, <laughs> over to you now, Glenn. <laughs> well, and and I think part of that, yeah. Hey, if you read through one all of one Peter, you know one Peter, you know Peter's writing because he's preparing them for the fiery ordeal. There's something that's going to come upon the church. Persecution, maybe yeah. that was Emperor Nero, you know, when he's writing, yeah. you know, f- Great Fire of Rome, 64 AD, all of that he's writing just before that. Maybe Peter saw the writing on the wall. He knew there was stuff coming. And right throughout, uh, you know, 1 Peter, he talks about, you know, don't be surprised by suffering, it's going to come, you know. And it's like, why are you so surprised? This is part of the normal Christian life. Um, he said, so suffering's going to come. You're going to go through hard times. It's going to be difficult. But we've got this hope, and it's the hope of glory. And a- again, that aspect of the gospel we talked about, the precious, yeah. the city with the precious stones. I think whenever you're going through a hard time, you've got to lift up your eyes, <laughs> and you've got to look forward to that. Hey, this might seem tough. I mean, I, I think for us, we always say, well, it's tough. But we could be in the Gaza Strip today. You know, it's tough. We could be living in Syria. Yeah. You know, it, it, you yeah. know it's, it's really not that tough when you start to compare. Our problem is we always compare up rather than down. We compare with those who are doing better or seem to have a better life rather than those who are. But I, I think, you know, comparing in that way really helps you. But I think looking forward, you know, this is tough, but this too shall pass. Yeah. Um, and. And knowing that God's going to do something in these tough things too. Because he promises <coughs> in his word that he will. He promises. Yeah. He pro- and I, I remember when we left Nexus to go and plant, um, you know, and church, uh, 
at fir- I didn't have a job at that time. <coughs> I'd left a good job and, a, yeah. you know, I, I think I could have stayed there till retirement if yeah. I wanted to. But we left and I remember walking along the beach, just go up to Bribey Island and walk on the seaside up there you know, in the morning and I remember just saying, wow, what have we done? <coughs> What happens if no one comes? What happens if we can't yeah. do it? What happens if, the, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and there are quite a few times like that we thought, wow. And then just every, at every turn, the Lord turned up. And I, I think it's having that, you know, that, hey, God's work, it, 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 he's going to do it. And if he's calling us to be involved with it, he's going to provide for what we need. Uh, was it Hudson Taylor who said, God's work done God's way, won't let God supply? <coughs> and I think that's true. So we're always looking forward. We're looking past the difficult thing that we're in. Yeah. Um, that doesn't make it any easier. But, it, I mean, when, you, when you've got that view of, well, God, you know, all things work for the good of those that love God and called according to his purpose. We say that, but if we can believe that in those difficult times, and that's going to help us look forward to the future. So we have that hope. We have that hope of glory. We have that hope of something in the future. How to flourish <coughs> in tough times. There you go. I know in a tough life. season, God, <laughs> I've got Romans 8.32. Yes, it came yeah. to me like a bolt, like a rhema word. Mm. If God is for me, who can, who be, can against be against me? me? That's a great word. Like yeah. I said, we've got a collection of that. It's got to be one That's of my true. top 10, maybe top 500 scriptures <laughs> ever. <laughs> Glenn Cochran, yeah. I love who you are. I love our friendship. Love that we've always got a good laugh. We've got the t- annual test match cricket coming up in the next couple of months. Looking T- forward to that. Tickets are booked day three. Great. It's going to be amazing. West I'm just really amazed and admire your great work, your longevity in ministry. I could see the best is yet to come. <laughs> but there's always mm. the sense of um, purpose and determination mm. with mm. you. So mm. I'm really mm. thankful that you're in my world, mm. Glenn Cochran. Thank you for being on The Flourishing Life today. Thank you, Andrew. God bless you, mate. Bless you too. Hey, if you've enjoyed this episode, can you do me just one thing? One favour, please. Can I encourage you to share with this with a friend, a colleague, or someone who would be blessed or inspired or challenged by some of the content? I love the guests that we have, and they bring such a richness of them Uh, for the benefit of Kingdom Purpose. So please share it with one friend. God bless you.